Welcome everyone. Before we go into introductions, I want to remind everyone of two things today. First, there will be a Q&A at the end, so please prepare your questions. You can enter your questions on the Q&A function on your screen anytime. And second, we will be recording today's webinar. So we'll send a link to everyone in the next couple of days. It is a pleasure to be with you here today. My name is Claudia Hirawat. I am a patient, a patient advocate, and the executive chair of a company called Voss Advisors that advises biopharmaceutical companies on how to take the input, the perspective of patients and other stakeholders into decision-making. Today, we are speaking about how decisions are being made during the COVID-19 pandemic. There are critical decisions being made with less evidence than usual, sometimes out of necessity, sometimes out of political pressure. In the research realm, data safety monitoring boards face difficult questions about how to balance the need for sufficient data for a clinical trial to demonstrate a meaningful effect size with the pressure to quickly advance promising research and halt harmful or ineffective studies. There's an enormous race to produce a vaccine which has been tangled with political promises and is likely to have an impact beyond that of any vaccine. FDA has made unprecedented use of its emergency use authorizations for drugs and devices on a standard of proof that is far weaker from what is required for traditional marketing approvals. And organizations have had to develop clinical and public health recommendations and resource allocation protocols under circumstances where good information and resources are both in short supply. Our panelists today are ethicists with experience in access to investigational treatments and vaccines, regulatory science, and clinical trials. They will address the research, regulatory, and clinical challenges arising from attempting to balance the desire and necessity for quick decisions with the fact of incomplete data. We'll tackle questions such as, should what counts as sufficient evidence for policy determinations change in a crisis? And beyond COVID-19, what are the implications for crisis that affect only certain populations, such as patients with diseases for which treatments do not exist? In a pluralistic society, who determines what level of evidence is sufficient? I will introduce the panels in the order they will present today. Our first presenter is Dr. Matthew Winia. Dr. Winia is the director of the Center for Bioethics and Humanities of the University of Colorado. Dr. Winia is a past president of the American Society for Bioethics and Humanities, ASBH, and has chaired the Ethics Forum of the American Public Health Association, APHA, and the Ethics Committee of the Society for General Internal Medicine, SGIM. Our second presenter today will be Holly Fernandez Lynch, Assistant Professor of Medical Ethics at the Perelman School of Medicine, University of Pennsylvania. Ms. Fernandez Lynch has named a Greenwall Faculty Scholar in 2019 with funding for research focused on the ethics of health care gatekeeping, including in the context of access to investigational therapies outside clinical trials before they have been approved by the FDA. During the COVID-19 pandemic, she has focused on FDA policy, drug and vaccine development, ethical conduct of research, and allocation of scarce investigational products. Our third presenter is Professor Arthur Kaplan, the doctors William F. and Virginia Connolly Medi Professor and founding head of the Division of Medical Ethics at NYU School of Medicine in New York City. And our fourth panelist today will be Dr. Allison Bateman House. Dr. Bateman House is Assistant Professor, Department of Population Health at NYU Grossman School of Medicine. Dr. Bateman House is the co-chair of the Working Group on Compassionate Use and Pre-Approval Access, CUPA, of which Dr. Kaplan, myself, and Ms. Uh, Fernandez Lynch is, are also members, and the co-chair of the Working Group on Pediatric Gene Therapy and Medical Ethics. She's co-chair of the research project on ethics in real world evidence and serves on two data safety monitoring boards, one for the National Eye Institute and one for the investigator initiated research at NYU Langone Health. 
With that, we're going to get started with Dr. Winia with our first presenter. And I'm going to pull up the slides. Your slides are up. Great. I just, I just shared my slides. Is that uh, showing Perfect. that properly? Can someone give me a thumbs up that- uh, Yes, that it's working. My slides? Thank mm -hmm. you. So uh, in some ways, I, I think, uh, first of all, thank you, Claudia, for that uh, wonderful introduction, um, both to us uh, as people and to this issue or set of issues. I feel like in some ways I have the easiest of the jobs because um, I'm supposed to sort of set the stage, which basically means I'm going to ask a bunch of questions, frame a bunch of challenges, and then leave it to um, Allison and Holly and Art to give you all of the answers. Mm -hmm. um, so, so here's uh, here's where we're going to start, though. Oh, I I don't have any significant uh, disclosures. Um, there are a few products that our center produces. None of these are going to be uh, talked about today. So, um, so let's start with uh, with this poll everywhere question. And if you've not used poll everywhere before, um, what you're going to want to do is open a browser window, uh, go to pollev.com slash mwinia623. And um, that will immediately give you the option. You can also do it by texting, but not, not for what we're going to do today. Um, so go to that web browser and, and give me an answer to this question. When you think about evidence-based policies and practices in the pandemic, what words come to mind? And someone apparently knew we were going to do this because they already sent in a word. Um, and we're going to slowly uh, build a word cloud together. And you can keep adding to this word cloud as we go along. Once you have that window opened, um, you can keep adding to this. So, so pressure had the early lead because someone had put it in there. Um, before we got started. Ah, but now science has uh, has gained on it. Rhetoric, uh, limited information, iterative. I like iterative, rational. Um, waiting for irrational now to show up. Um, so, so we'll keep building this cloud, and we'll come back to this uh, when uh, when we get to the end of the session. Um, I just want to show you a, a graph that was uh, put together. This is obviously a, a made up graph, um, but it, it came out a couple weeks ago in, an, in a piece in JAMA um, by Chris Seymour, Aaron McCreary, and Jacob Zipenga, who um, essentially posit that there are a couple different types of doctors. Um, there are people who are sort of medical nihilists who prefer uh, a low intensity intervention and require a relatively high degree of certainty before they will adopt a new procedure. And then there are the hawkish interventionists who are uh, much more willing to sort of dive in um, and, uh, and, and do things on the basis of relatively little evidence if it has some chance. Hawkish interventionism, I'll just uh, point out, is what was uh, 100 or 150 years ago called heroic medicine. Um, heroic medicine is the desire to just do something, in part because this gives you a sense of control. It's sometimes been called an illusion of control. But the notion here is that when there's a, a, an emergency, it's better to just do something, don't just stand there. And unfortunately, that mindset um, not only le led to things like uh, leeches and bleeding and purging uh, back in the era of heroic medicine, it also leads to things like autologous bone marrow transplantation for uh, women with widely metastatic breast cancer, which um, you know has an enormous amount of in, impetus behind it, very understandable. And yet, um, because people were sort of hawkish interventionists in that field, it took over a decade for us to learn that um, that therapeutic modality was actually killing people uh, and was not curing them. So. Um, there are two comments I just want to make about this uh, this paper that, that came out last week. One is um, it's probably an oversimplification to suggest that um, people in medicine are either medical nihilists or hawkish interventionists. Um, there are people today, and I, I say this because I think I'm one of them, um, who lean more towards medical nihilism and wanting to see more evidence available, but we feel like we are being pushed unwillingly 
up the slope towards hawkish interventionism by this pandemic. Um, we're being forced to make decisions on the basis of relatively limited evidence. The other um, comment I would make about the, the paper is that one of the things the authors suggested should be done to mitigate this risk of um, it, inappropriate hawkish interventionism to get to what they call a sensible median, sensible medicine approach, is to think Bayesian. And interestingly, just before that paper came out in JAMA, the week before, there was a nice piece in uh, the New England Journal of Medicine, Niels Rosenquist, who essentially complained about um, the challenge that he was facing in, um, in this era where Bayesian medicine was being pushed to its very limits. He, said, he mentions, for example, that um, it's widely understood that the, that the broad knowledge base of medicine doubles about every two years, which is an incredibly fast rate of growth. And yet, from a practitioner's standpoint, day-to-day -day medical practice does not tend to change at quite that kind of breakneck speed. Um, and he said, what we're experiencing with COVID is what he calls Bayesian fatigue, a, a stress-induced dysphoria that arises when the body of knowledge that you have acquired over years or even decades, and that is the foundation of your life's work, um, suddenly becomes uh, less important than information you're getting from the president um, and Newsweek and NPR um, in real time. And here's what is in part driving this is, uh, this is not from medicine really, that th this is something that people uh, use all the time in the tech world. There's an innovation trigger, and then there's a, a rapid ar ascent to a peak of inflated expectations, which then tends to descend quickly into a trough of disillusionment. And then whatever this new technology is, eventually achieves the slope of enlightenment to the plateau of productivity. And I would say, Dexamethasone for people with um, critical illness has already gone through this, right? Um, very early on, more than a decade ago, there were trials done looking at dexamethasone in uh, sepsis. We had high hopes that it was going to work. It failed miserably. We entered the trough of disillusionment. And now recent trials with COVID suggest that in this, vi in this particular viral illness uh, with ARDS, maybe dexamethasone, in fact, probably dexamethasone has some level of uh, productivity, some worthwhile utilization. But as you all will know from the last nine months, we've also seen things like remdesivir, peak of expectations, trough of disillusionment, maybe a slope of enlightenment. I would say that could dip back down into the trough of disillusionment, depending on if you pay attention to the World Health Organization or to uh, the manufacturers of remdesivir. Um, and of course, hydroxychloroquine, which likewise saw this peak of inflated expectations and has never recovered um, out of the trough of disillusionment. Um, what, we're, what we've been seeing, and this is a beautiful piece in the New York Times Magazine uh, a couple months ago now, about uh, physicians who um, are essentially w at war with each other. And, and I would say not just at war with each other, but at war within ourselves about the right thing to do when faced with a desperately ill patient and inadequate information about what will work for that patient and what might not work. Um, the desire to do something is incredibly strong, in part because these may be people who you know, are about to die anyways. And so the, the sense of take a shot um, is incredibly powerful. And yet, of course, the consequences of doing that are that we never learn whether that thing that you're taking a shot on actually works or doesn't work. But those consequences for the patient are very immediate, very salient, very short term. The consequences in terms of benefit to society, learning through participation in a trial, those all feel a little bit more abstract, a little bit more remote, a little bit different, diff more difficult to calculate. So um, this uh, author describes uh, heated exchanges in the ICU where um, individual clinicians are saying, look, I have to do what I think is best here, um, even if we don't have perfect data, while the researcher, uh, who may also be a critical care medicine clinician, is saying, wait, 
we have to maintain the trial integrity because that's the only way we learn whether your taking a shot is actually beneficial or harmful. So this has led a number of people to suggest that every patient should be entered into a randomized controlled trial, which is a lovely idea, except for the fact that it is virtually impossible to get this actually set up. And it's not just impossible because of issues of disputes over equipoise, right? So we, we may have equipoise across our entire professional community, but if the way you achieve equipoise is by half of doctors thinking it works and half of doctors thinking it hurts, that's equipoise, professional equipoise, but it's not facilitative of getting a trial done. So um, there are issues of just disputes about whether we know enough already to make clinical decisions or not. There are also a number of other issues around how to improve clinical trial enrollment. This paper came out um, and describes the experience at Massachusetts General Hospital, um, one of the top research hospitals in the world. Um, and at Mass General, here is their chart of how many patients were asked to enroll in a clinical trial and how many patients were actually referred into a clinical trial during their spring surge. They do not report how many people had COVID during this time, but I hazard to say it's a relatively low number of people who have COVID who are ever even approached to get into a clinical trial. And that's before you start thinking, and that's in an academic medical center, by the way, a big research intensive AMC. Most patients are not seen in academic medical centers. And on top of that is the fact that it's a lot easier to just prescribe hydroxychloroquine than it is to just randomize that patient into an RCT of hydroxychloroquine versus placebo. The first requires only that you write a prescription the latter requires that you establish a clinical trial um, and that you become a site for that clinical trial. On top of all that, we have a bunch of patients, um, but varying numbers in varying institutions. And these are all compete, all of these patients are uh, essentially in competition for different trials because there are a lot of trials out there now. And those trials often, unfortunately, fail to enroll partly because a surge of patients may come to the place the trial is taking place. By the time the trial gets stood up, that surge has passed, and now the trial has a difficult time enrolling. Um, let me just close with uh, two comments or two, a couple of slides here on policy, because in addition to wanting better evidence for clinical practice, uh, we would be well served to have better evidence to guide policy in pandemics. Um, this is a National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine report that came out in August. Um, it was a three-year report. Um, I served on the panel here. It was CDC funded. And the idea was to synthesize all of the evidence base behind the public health emergency preparedness and response capabilities that are required um, by the CDC and the federal government. And I'm just gonna show you two slides to make a quick point. Um, the piece of this project that I was most involved with is here, the non-pharmaceutical interventions. Um, these are things like masks and quarantine. We focused our efforts on quarantine, and you'll see that there's actually a fair number of studies on non-pharmaceutical interventions compared to the other domains of emergency preparedness and response. And yet, when we start looking at quantitative studies, that have a solid impact as their outcome, it's a very small sliver of the total of the pie in terms of all that has been written about public health emergency preparedness and response. Very small number of studies, even within the non-pharmaceutical intervention domain where there were more such quantitative studies than others, most of the quantitative studies in non-pharmaceutical interventions looking at quarantine were things like um, modeling studies or surveys asking people about their experiences during quarantine. So just to conclude here, um, the committee looked at, you know, a very broad array of research and essentially said, we are seriously deficient in the evidence base for understanding what aspects of uh, preparedness and response are effective and which are not. Um, and it really raises the question, you know, what if we could randomly assign organizations or areas or cities or even states to the application of different models for disease prevention and control or different decision models for reopening schools? 
if we could do that, how much faster might we be learning about the best approaches for managing this pandemic? So I'll stop there and uh, we'll come back to the word cloud at the end. Great, thank you, Matt. I'm gonna go ahead and share my slides now. Bear with me for just a second. Okay. Can you see that? Yes. All right. Okay, great. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today. My name is Holly Fernandez Lynch, um, and I'm going to be spending my portion of the panel focused on emergency use authorizations and both the, the level of evidence that's required for FDA to grant one of these EUAs and also the impact that EUAs have on the capacity to generate evidence going forward. Oops, doesn't let me progress. My, my disclosures are um, fairly straightforward. As Claudia mentioned, I'm a member of the CUPA working group um, within the Division of Medical Ethics at NYU Langone Health. It's chaired by Allison and Art, and I have funding from the Greenwall Foundation on this topic. So the key points that I wanna make um, over the next um, 12 to 15 minutes or so um, is that there's a trade-off here when we're thinking about emergency use authorization. EUAs emphasize access, right? Patient access in the midst of a public health emergency over the need to have really strong confidence um, supported by evidence about the safety and efficacy of various interventions, okay? And we can debate um, you know, whether that makes sense in the context of a public health emergency and how to balance access and evidence. But the key point that I want you to walk away with today is that if we use the EUA authority prematurely, then we can actually end up upsetting that balance between access and evidence in the long term, making it difficult to secure evidence even after um, kind of the emergency circumstances pass. So what is the legal standard for emergency use authorization? Well, first, it's, it's two steps. Basically, the Department of Health and Human Services has to determine that there is an emergency. Um, it could be a domestic emergency, military, or public health emergency. And then emergency needs to involve what are known as CBRN agents chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear agents. And that's really important because there are lots of emergency diseases and conditions, right? Things that are serious and life-threatening, um, but that don't that? stem from this type of agent, okay? And so this is a particular authority not available um, for many types of diseases and conditions, and it's time limited for the duration of that emergency. Okay, so that's step one, HHS makes its determination. And then that facilitates FDA having the authority to issue emergency use authorization of particular products. So the first condition for an EUA is that, that there has to be a serious or life-threatening disease or condition resulting from a CBRN agent. We're clearly there, right? We've got um, COVID-19 from these biological uh, you know, agents being the virus. And then FDA has to determine that the product may be effective. And that's different from the traditional approval standard. It's a lower evidentiary standard. FDA must also determine that known and potential benefits of the intervention outweigh the known and potential risks of that intervention, all against the backdrop of you know, the disease or condition that's intended to be treated. And then finally, FDA has to determine that there's no adequate approved available alternative. And you might wonder as we're kind of stacking up these EUAs for COVID-19, whether we're eventually going to hit the point of, you know, actually having adequate available alternatives. That's a pretty flexible standard, right? We don't have a COVID cure. Um, so I think uh, FDA is going to have a lot of wiggle room in terms of what's considered adequate and available. We also have a number of supply challenges, which I'll talk about. So how does this standard, the emergency use authorization standard, compare to another pathway by which patients who are suffering from serious and life-threatening diseases and conditions without um, adequate treatment options are able to get access to those products pre-approval, right? The expanded access pathway um, exists outside of public health emergencies, and it has a lot of um, similarities to the EUA standards, right? You have to have a serious or immediately life-threatening disease or condition. When expanded access is provided to larger groups of patients, the evidentiary standard looks uh, very close to the EUA standard. There's reference to may be effective for the uh, disease or condition. 
It also has to be true that the potential benefits outweigh potential risks, and there has to be no comparable or satisfactory alternative, right? Those things all look quite familiar from the EY standard. But what's different is that e, uh, expanded access is not limited to CBRN agents. If you're only asking for expanded access for a single patient, then you actually don't need to have any evidence of efficacy yet. You don't even have to meet the may be effective threshold. IRB authorization is required for expanded access. And this is the clincher. FDA has to determine that providing the drug through this pathway will not interfere with clinical trials that could support marketing approval, okay? So if you think about that balance between evidence and access, the EUA standard is prioritizing access, whereas the expanded access standard, despite its name, is prioritizing evidence. Very quick history of emergency use authorizations. They've been used most often for diagnostics um, and antibody tests, as well as PPE and other devices. That has been true for COVID-19 as well. Before COVID, this pathway was infrequently used for therapeutics and prophylactics. I'm not gonna go into detail about all of these examples, but for the most part, um, it was used for products that were already in use for other diseases and conditions. Um, you know, For example, seasonal flu instead of H1N1. There's only been one emergency use authorization for a vaccine to date, and that was for the anthrax vaccine. Very complicated regulatory history, which we can talk about during the Q&A, but I flagged it here because that EUA was issued for a vaccine that pre-existed the military or the, the kind of terrorism threat around anthrax. Whereas what we're talking about for a COVID vaccine EUA is for products that have never um, been used uh, prior to this pandemic. So let me walk you through a couple of COVID EUAs for therapeutics because they kind of exist on a spectrum from um, what were you thinking to, you know, we actually have some pretty significant debate about whether the EUA was issued prematurely, uh, but reasonable people might think it was an acceptable thing to do. So let's start with hydroxychloroquine. This is on the what were you thinking side of the spectrum. This was a product or a set of products that were available for off-label use use. Um, and based on really limited, scant data um, from in vitro analysis and case, re case reports, FDA issued the emergency use authorization and ultimately revoked it following data indicating a lack of efficacy and safety concerns. And we know that FDA experienced political pressure um, because it has been extremely well documented in a whistleblower complaint from uh, Rick Bright, the former head of BARDA. Okay, so this is, um, you know, a bad example of using the EUA authority. Now, a more interesting example, I think, is from, uh, from remdesivir. This was a product that was not available um, off-label, right, a totally unapproved product. It had um, a significant uh, expanded access program before the EUA was granted, and Gilead was pretty careful about making sure that there was no interference with the trials that were necessary to figure out um, you know, about safety and efficacy of this product. Based on top line data from an NIH randomized controlled trial, uh, the EUA was granted. And that trial demonstrated a reduced time to recovery in certain severely ill hospitalized patients, but not a mortality benefit. Okay, so well-designed trial, good data indicating this reduced time to recovery. The emergency use authorization um, was not limited to patients who are unable to enroll in a trial. That is something that FDA has the authority to require. But based on the available data from that NIH trial, the standard of care changed, including treatment guidelines both from NIH and the Infectious Disease Society of America. So that starts to look pretty good, right? Like, great, we have this authority, it's been used properly. But <laughs> then, you know, soon after, um, um, the emergency use authorization is issued. We have further clinical analysis and reports out from the WHO solidarity trial um, in which uh, remdesivir does not appear to have any benefit. There's um, a lot of debate about how to square these two trials. They were done in different locations. They had different designs, different endpoints. And so the result of the WHO um, study did not change the US treatment guidelines, but WHO 
WHO actually has just put out its own guidelines with um, a weak and conditional recommendation not to use remdesivir, which um, you know the the public discussion seems to suggest is not only based on um, the kind of disparity in evidence between those two studies, but also concerns about the cost of rem remdesivir at a couple of thousand dollars per per patient, right? If we don't have strong evidence to support its use, that's uh, probably why WHO came out the way it did. Now, um, that I think is a good example of what happens with an EUA. You have this relatively weak standard for authorization. You expect that research is going to continue you if possible. And so subsequent analysis might indicate something different from the first analysis. Um, I think this is a reasonable example of the use of the EUA authority. I would not suggest that FDA ought to have pulled um, the, the EUA authority following the WHO results. But inexplicably, what FDA did was grant full a full marketing approval for remdesivir without calling together an advisory committee and without even mentioning the solidarity trial. Okay, so that is kind of um, a head scratcher for me, is not a necessary step, right? Gilead could charge for the drug, it could fully market the drug under the EUA. And what we have now is less motivation for the sponsor to engage in continued study. And it's more difficult for FDA to pull approval, um, full marketing approval compared to an emergency use author. Authorization. Now, another example um, of, of an EUA has been granted for convalescent plasma. This is more in the, the head scratcher category because there was a massive expanded access program for convalescent plasma. Tens of thousands of patients were dosed with this product, um, indicating that it was safe, but um, really didn't give us strong evidence about efficacy because it was not a randomized um, controlled trial, right? So the data looked promising but inconclusive from that expanded access program. The NIH and CDC urged FDA not to proceed with an emergency use authorization, saying it would be premature to do so. We know there was some pressure from, uh, from the White House, and FDA did go ahead and issue that emergency use authorization. In the EUA itself, FDA explicitly noted that it should not uh, be treated as changing the standard of care. And unlike remdesivir, um, both NIH and ISDA did not change their treatment guidelines um, on the basis of the EUA for convalescent plasma. Okay, so that's um, you know debatable, right? We have this emergency use uh, authorization pathway. Um, people can be of different minds about whether we should wait longer and have more data before that's, that authority is used. Now, monoclonal antibodies have been in the news recently. We have two EUAs um, for Lilly's product and for the Regeneron product. Um, and I think here, the strength of the evidence that we have is probably closer to convalescent plasma than to remdesivir. Now, the antibodies were used in um, well-designed RCTs, um, but from what I've read, there have been kind of few hospitalizations, few events, and so still um, not much data to go on. In fact, the NIH guidelines indicate that um, the Lilly product should not be considered standard of care and continues to encourage use in trials. Okay, so that's another one where people I think could reasonably debate whether the EUA was issued prematurely. I'm going to leave discussion of uh, vaccines to art. Um, I think the EUAs on these are obviously coming um, and there's going to raise a lot of challenges about continued study for vaccines once the EUAs come down. All right, before I close, I want to highlight three challenges that the EUA pathway raises for evidence production. The first is because it's a pretty low standard that FDA has to use here, um, it's harder to insulate FDA from political interference, right? And typically FDA can say, we're going to follow the science, we're going to um, you know, pay attention to the trial data that comes in, we're going to make that sure that this high standard for marketing approval is met. For the EUA standard to be met, it basically just has to be true that there's not kind of proactive evidence of inefficacy or a lack of safety. Basically anything else can satisfy the EUA standard of may be effective, okay? And so that can be particularly tricky for vaccines where we know public trust is hanging in the balance. So FDA has tried to buttress the EUA standard by requiring additional safety data. Um, I don't wanna speak for others on the panel, but I for one am a little bit less worried now that we're um, you know, going to be transitioning to a new administration and now that we're seeing the efficacy results come in.
And Commissioner Hahn has also now made a promise to publish uh, FDA's scientific reviews for EUAs, which will increase transparency. Another challenge that that, um, that Matt uh, alluded to here is that once you issue an EUA, it can be much harder to run well-designed trials, okay? Um, because it becomes difficult to convince patients who could get a product outside of a trial to be willing to be randomized, potentially not to receive that product. And that can make it challenging to continue data collection of the product that received the EUA, as well as for other products, and that can result in perpetuating the uncertainty that exists when the EUA is issued. So typically, we want to wait to permit widespread access until we have reasonable certainty of safety and efficacy, um, or at least plans, clear plans that will allow us to continue study. And I'll just flag here that scarcity can actually help in this regard. So what we're seeing with regard to the monoclonal antibodies, the difficulty producing those may make it possible to continue studying them because it will be more difficult for patients to access them outside of a trial. And then the last point that I wanna raise is how are we going to think about the EUA standard once we're past this pandemic? So think about what we have said to patient communities. When we're in the midst of a public health emergency and people might die because we lack access and um, we, we lack approved interventions that we can kind of throw caution to the wind and really reduce our evidentiary standards. Well, what about those patients who are dying from diseases that are not caused by, you know, a public health emergency? Those are the patients that we've told they, you know, you have to wait. You have to wait until we are pretty certain about safety and efficacy. You've got to follow FDA's traditional pathways for approval. How are we going to kind of continue with that message in a post-pandemic world? And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Allison. Thank you, Holly. I'm going to try to pull up my screen. I think I need to stop sharing here. Bear with me for one second. All right, hopefully that's visible. So I got the notice that we are running uh, off of our scheduled time and that I need to pick up the pace. So this is going to be the fastest iteration ever of me talking about this, but I am hoping that we can uh, pick it up during the Q&A if there's any point you want me to elaborate. So again, I'm Allison Bateman House. I'm at NYU School of Medicine with Art Kaplan. Uh, I co-chair the Working Group on Compassionate Use and Pre-Approval Access, which several of the other panelists participate in. And I'm talking about uh, data safety monitoring decisions. We're talking about, you know, what sort of evidence do you need to make decisions, whether they're clinical decisions, regulatory decisions. Now I'm talking about the decisions that data safety monitoring boards would be making. So with that, uh, my disclosure is that I serve on three data safety monitoring boards. So again, I'm doing this fast. So we'll, uh, we'll circle back if you have questions, but Thalidomide and other such examples have shown us that it is really important to make sure we understand how a drug works uh, before it is brought onto the market for, for people to be able to use. So we require pre-market safety, safety and efficacy testing generally done through clinical trials. But then of course, there's a question about when we have an epidemic or to flag back to what Holly just said a, a second ago, an emergency of some type, do we say, you know, well, maybe we don't need as much data as we normally would. Maybe there's some way we can, you know, shave off some time and get products out to people quicker, uh, simply because um, maybe less evidence is, is okay in an in a urgent situation, or maybe not. So, you know, what we're talking about is we're saying that in a trial, you collect a, data, you collect a lot of data, different kinds of data, and at some point that data morphs into evidence. And it's evidence of efficacy, it's evidence of lack of efficacy, it's evidence of safety. And, and what I want to underscore here is, you know, that's not just data that's useful for knowing, you know, does this product work or does it not work? It's important data ethically because it's unethical ethical to continue a study 
once we know which product of the ones that we could possibly assign you to receive is better for you, which one works, which one causes the most harm, et cetera. And it's also an ethical to continue a study once it's apparent that this study is not going to be completely uh, fully accrued. So if we had a goal of having 600 patients and we can tell, you know, we're halfway through and we've only gotten 100 patients, it's just not going to happen. We can't keep pulling people into that trial. So these are the sort of questions that data safety monitoring boards are looking at and trying to decide when it's time to say we're stopping the trial. So I just have here that, you know, this is not only a trial stopping rule issue. Uh, these questions about can we can we modify things in the context of an emergency have, you know, regulatory and trial design um, issues as well. But so for those of you who are not familiar with data safety monitoring boards, this is the policy from the National Institutes of Health in 1998. And it just very simply says all clinical trials require monitoring. If it's not a big deal trial, then maybe it can just be the, you know, the, the, the person who's running the trial, keeping an eye on things and making sure they're going well. But when you have a higher stakes trial, you have to have an independent board, this data safety monitoring board. And if you look in the, the center paragraph here in blue, it says a monitoring committee is usually required to determine safe and effective conduct and to recommend conclusion of the trial when significant benefits or risk have developed or the trial is unlikely to be concluded successfully. And you know, I just wanna highlight the word here, significant, because what is a significant benefit? What is the significant risk? That's not something that, that you know, is, is preset out in the, in the universe. It's something that the Data Safety Monitoring Board and the FDA and the sponsor and you know, all these stakeholders decide amongst themselves this is what we're deciding is significant versus this is what we think doesn't meet that standard. Now, uh, several of us have a colleague, Steve Joffe at UPenn, who wrote on Twitter uh, just over a month ago, you know, I think data safety monitoring boards are the single most ethically interesting and challenging component of the entire research enterprise. And I agree, and I think others do too. So I have a list here of several of my colleagues who are working in this space. And I just want to say that I, uh, you know, to lay my cards on the table, I really um, agree with a statement by London and Kimmelman who wrote recently, rather than generating permission to carry out low quality investigations, the urgency and scarcity of pandemics heighten the responsibility of key actors in the research enterprise to coordinate their activities to uphold the standards necessary to advance this mission. And this mission is, of course, generating the knowledge we need to be able to determine what is actually a safe and effective treatment. Um, so to me, uh, we pandem pandemic exceptionalism, where we, you know, cut some slack and say, you know, we don't need as much evidence as normal. I don't think that's the way to go. I think it's even more important to say we only get one chance to do this and we've got to do it right. But this is debatable. And I wish I could spend my allotted time talking to you and debating this, but I can't. Because before we can discuss what evidence is appropriate for data safety monitoring boards to make decisions, we have to be certain that data safety monitoring boards are making evidence-based decisions. And this really has been called into question in COVID-19. So that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to share three quick cases. And I want to just reiterate, I serve on data safety monitoring boards. I am proud of the work that I do there. I'm proud of the work of my colleagues. I think that uh, there are certainly data safety monitoring boards that are doing great work. Um, but I think there also have been some, some things that are concerning. And maybe if I was on the inside, it wouldn't be concerning. Maybe I just have outsider's bias, but, but I'm going to share them with you and you can see what you think. So remdesivir, Holly already talked about remdesivir. And the NIH trial that was being run ended in late April 2020 because the Data Safety Monitoring Board determined that the drug had met its goal of reducing time in hospital. And for those of you who may remember this, you'll remember that this, the stopping of the trial was announced at a press conference at the White House, which is not normally how these things are announced. You know, normally there would be a, a presentation at a scientific meeting, followed very soon thereafter, if not simultaneous, with a peer-reviewed publication in the academic press. But that was not the case here. Uh, it, it was put out, as I said, at, at the White House. And you can see in this um, quote here, 
Dr. Fauci told Reuters in a telephone interview, this was driven purely by ethical concerns. I would love to wait to present it at a scientific meeting, but it's just not in the cards when you have a situation where the ethical concern about getting the drug to people on placebo dominates the conversation. So basically the data safety monitoring board said this works. And so the decision was made if this works and there are other people out there who haven't been getting this, but they're still in hospital, they're still you know, sick, then we have a moral obligation to give them the remdesivir. Now, the problem with that, as you can see here, the actual peer reviewed full publication didn't come out until October 8th. And it wasn't that every patient who got remdesivir in that trial improved, it was only a subset of patients. So, you know, I just want to flag that when you say we're stopping the trial because of benefit, but then we don't give clinicians the evidence to know who gets benefit, I, I find that problematic. And of course, as Holly has already indicated, and I won't go into it here in the interest of time, now the WHO has recommended against the use of remdesivir in hospitalized patients. So, you know, the questions that this raises for me, and again, I'm an outsider, I wasn't on this data safety monitoring board. Did it halt the trial prematurely? If it did, was this because it was under pressure, be that political pressure, be that societal pressure, what have you? And then as I already said, is it ethical to halt a trial, but then not to immediately release the data necessary to guide clinicians in using that new investigational product? So moving on to our second case, just in the interest of time, this is NeuroRx. This is from an article that was published by Politico. And Politico's article really took this angle of, there is a Republican doctor who is also a, a, a representative, he's, he's a member of Congress, who uh, has been very skeptical of mass mandates and, and generally of you know, the whole idea that people need to use masks to, to stop the spread of disease. And now he's on a data safety monitoring board for this intervention. And isn't that weird that you would have this you know, public health skeptic involved in a trial? That doesn't bother me that much. What bothers me is who else was involved in the trial. So as you can see in this article, it says um, several bioethicists question this, this individual, Andy Harris's lack of experience in evaluating data from drug trials and his close ties to the CEO. And he was not the only one. So there were three people on the trial. One, Al Alfred Sommer was a very renowned public health person, but he had never been on a data safety monitoring before. The other one, again, a renowned academic, but an aquatic biologist who had been on a data safety monitoring board, but had never done anything you know, like this, you know, obviously not for COVID and not for a, a critical care type situation. And crucially, nobody who fit the biostatistician knowledgeable about statistical methods for clinical trials and sequential analysis of trial data that the FDA suggest be at least one member of your data safety monitoring committee. And all three of these members have relationships with the CEO of the company. So this raises questions for me about possible conflict of interest, obviously lack of appropriate expertise on data safety monitoring board, and really the lack of experience in critical care and infectious disease medicine. And I'll tell you, as someone who serves on a data safety monitoring board, and I'm not a clinician, I'm an ethicist, I am reliant on my colleagues who know very sick patients to tell me, you know, this, yeah, this is what we would expect to see in this patient, or mm, this is problematic and troubling, and it's a signal that we should look at strongly. So I, I would be very concerned about, um, you know, the efficacy of this data safety monitoring board to meet its mandate. And then last but not least, the COVID-19 vaccines. So in this case, I think we've probably all heard now about the government's Operation Warp Speed. What you may not have heard is that all the vaccine trials participating in Operation Warp Speed share the same data safety monitoring board. And you know, just looking at the sort of issues that have come up earlier, you might be thinking, well, who's on that board and what sort of pressures are they subject to by whom? And uh, it, as this article goes on to explain, data safety member monitoring board names are generally kept confidential unless they, like me, self-disclose. And the question is, you know, oops, I'm sorry, I skipped a slide. Um, you know, is that good in the, in the public interest of keeping these names confidential because they can't be pressured if they don't know who, if you don't know who they are? 
or in this context right now where we've already had politicization of all sorts of decision making and real concerns about you know how vetted these vaccines are going to be used before they're used in people should we know who are making these decisions and ProPublica actually ferreted out the names of some of these data safety monitoring board members and they're really like you know well established people the kind of people you would want doing this so that at least gave me some some faith that i had not previously had so in this case it might actually be worthwhile to have those names be public but that it is sort of a break from the norm so just in summary you know we have this ongoing, you know, ever present concern of when should data safety monitoring boards stop trials? How much data is enough? Uh, you know, and does that vary from context to context? Does the threshold of evidence differ in a public health emergency like COVID-19? Or as Holly, you know, uh, suggested, perhaps just an area of unmet need. So for example, ALS, there's so little out there. Should we be willing to countenance a lower level of efficacy to bring a drug out of trials and make it available to people? But on top of this, you know, sort of evergreen concern, we have these new concerns about, you know, who's making these decisions on what grounds. And then finally, uh, when the trial has been stopped on, you know, whether appropriately or not, when is the data going to be released for clinicians to use? So that's it for me. Uh, hopefully I made it up a little bit of time and I would love to introduce uh, my colleague and boss, um, Dr. Arthur Kaplan. Hi, everybody. Let's see if I can get my screen shared here. Da, da, da. Gotta wait for Allison to come off, I think. Art, I think I'm off. I, your, your slides were up. And I'll try to catch us up a little little bit too, just going uh, quickly. Uh, thanks everybody for coming to uh, this. I've got the uh, vaccine portfolio here. And uh, as you know, uh, we're getting rapidly positive uh, findings on vaccines. We've had positive data on Pfizer's two-shot vaccine with heavy refrigeration requirements, Moderna's which also is the same platform requiring refrigeration, but not as radical as Pfizer's, which really requires big specialty refrigeration and specialty shipping. And we got news today from AstraZeneca, which I don't fully understand. Two doses produce 62% efficacy, a half dose and then a full dose following got up to 90% efficacy. They must have had some reason to try it that way, thinking that the primer might work better at a smaller dose, but I don't know what it is. But the good news about the AstraZeneca vaccine is it has even less specialty refrigeration and shipping requirements. And so this is all very exciting news on the vaccine front. But as Holly and Allison have talked about, these vaccines and the good news we're hearing about them are coming in with incomplete information, meaning they are uh, early data, they are two month or three month results uh, in groups that uh, the data safety and monitoring boards that are tracking this. Pfizer's an independent board. Pfizer's not working under Operation Warp Speed and um, the Operation Warp Speed vaccines like Moderna uh, and actually AstraZeneca having um, their own common data safety and monitoring board. But I trust the independence of the boards. And there are also safety officers looking within the companies at their own data. And I think the early results are absolutely trustworthy and very exciting. We've never in the history of vaccines seen something prove 90% effective, even 70% effective. After a year's worth of research, it's unbelievable. It's amazing. <laughs> um, the shortest vaccine before this that I know is four uh, years. And uh, so here we have a massive effort launched to get a vaccine. You might say the Trump administration in particular thought that the way out of the pandemic was vaccines and poured money into it. You may know that many of these vaccines are prepaid in terms of telling the company make it. And if it doesn't work, we'll throw it out. 
uh, it looks like it's going to work. And that means Pfizer and Moderna <coughs> have stock supplies already, not enough to vaccinate all of us, but probably 20 million two dose uh, amounts for Pfizer and maybe a smaller amount for Moderna and AstraZeneca also uh, has some doses already made and stored. So all of them will be applying apparently on December 10th at a uh, meeting for emergency use authorization. As Holly told you, that's a little bit broad in terms of being treated more like a therapy. What it means for vaccines is no specific informed consent. You would get a information sheet on the vaccine like you do when you get a flu vaccine. It doesn't really go into the fact that this is still investigational and an emergency use availability would be limited. It also means there's no IRB or research ethics committee oversight of what's going on. And it means that data tracking for people who get the vaccine is really up to the sponsor. FDA could require data tracking, but whether the sponsor does it, does it well, is ready to build a registry on all or some of the people who get emergency use access. That in the past, that's been a little mm, underperforming. Now, hopefully with all the attention here, that wouldn't happen, but EUA is not expanded access where you treat it more investigationally, I'm gonna say. It's the route that I personally and uh, others have favored. And some believe that it's a mistake to do either emergency use or expanded access. I think Allison is in the camp that says, until you really get your study done and you really know what's going on for safety and efficacy, say at six months, uh, complete your work, maybe you shouldn't do either uh, because you're really still taking a chance that uh, either the duration of the vaccine won't be good or you may see safety issues arise at six months. It's unusual in vaccines not to see safety issues after two months, but it has happened. Um, so there is a line that says don't do either. On the other hand, it's pandemic. Deaths are mounting every day in the US. We've got a broken economy. Schools closed. Things are bad, going to get worse in the winter. And there is no doubt, zero, that we're going to see an emergency use authorization. I've even argued that we should be meeting faster. I don't know why it's December 10. I think they should hustle it up and get it done more quickly because I think the uh, misery of the pandemic justifies taking the risk of doing either an EUA or expanded access, but it looks like it's going to be an EUA. Uh, right to try is out there too, but we don't have to talk about that because nobody's going to pursue it. So what happens, I think Holly hinted at this, but just to remind you, as soon as the EUA is granted, which I believe will be a day after the meeting on December 10th, um, you're basically confronted with a bunch of issues that I don't see anybody addressing or talking about yet. One is people in the studies, both uh, Moderna, uh, AstraZeneca, and Pfizer will say, I may be in the placebo group, I'd like to get this uh, vaccine, it seems to be working. Many of the people who signed up to be subjects in these studies are high risk healthcare workers. And I'm sure that they will wanna know. And some argue that we have to continue the studies. Some FDA officials have said that and make it available to others not in the studies and not unblind them. I'm gonna tell you ethically, I think that's ridiculous. You have to unblind these studies. Subjects absolutely have a right to know when important information like this thing might work becomes available. And I have no doubt that somebody better be ready to unblind these studies, the subjects will be asking. You could, as Holly has pointed out at different times, ask people to stay on voluntarily. They won't, but you could ask. That's possible, but they won't do it. Many won't do it. If you don't unblind, you're never going to recruit anybody to the next trials because it means anybody who's a subject is going to the back of the line to study future vaccines, and I don't think that's feasible. So I think you'll have to change the consent forms in starting to recruit both for ongoing studies and ones that might be coming out of the 80 vaccines or so that are in the pipeline. When you want those vaccines to proceed, they could be cheaper, easier to handle, could have uh, better efficacy in subgroups, the elderly or children, we don't know, so we gotta keep going, but it's gonna change the whole lay of the land. And I will just make a prediction and say, we're gonna be dealing 
with either real world evidence rather than randomized trial evidence into the future for vaccine trials because these early uh, positive returns, hyper positive returns are gonna make it tough to continue randomization for anybody. Um, as I said, we do need more vaccines because a two-shot vaccine, a one-shot vaccine is better. Compliance with two-shot vaccines is uneven and you do have to chase people around. They believe they're okay after the first shot. It's a pain in the neck. Refrigeration can be a pain in the neck, particularly for rural areas. We have different groups arguing about who's gonna get access, but where the refrigerators are for the Pfizer vaccine will drive who gets it. Cost is always an issue. Pfizer isn't part of warp speed. It may decide to charge privately. It's out on its own and can. Uh, there'll be a lot of pressure not to do that. But costs both in the US and outside the US, we want to get lower cost vaccines. So you want to keep studying things. Um, and better safety may turn out to be an issue. So we don't want to stop trials. But as I said, I think one of the prices of an early use approval, which remember I favor, is still going to be tough, tougher to recruit, tougher to conduct any randomized, large scale randomized uh, clinical trials of vaccines, I believe. That means, and I'll end with this, just watching the time, we may need to go to challenge studies to compare vaccines. We may need to go to challenge studies, which means deliberately infecting people with a uh, purified uh, COVID agent to challenge them, hopefully at the lowest dose, hopefully young people, so they don't get the risk is, isn't making them as sick. Hopefully making available the new therapies that are also coming out there that you've heard about today. We don't have a rescue therapy, but we're getting better. If you did get sick uh, at taking care of you, these would have to be brave altruistic volunteers who would say, if you wanna compare vaccine A to B, and you could learn by giving it, I think, uh, a challenge agent to 300 of us, we volunteer to do it. There are such people out there. They have signed up on websites. Whether they'd actually show up can be argued, but there's certainly 20, 30, 40,000 people who've said they would do it. The facilities to do it exist in the world. There are centers that do challenge studies. Normally, you like to have a rescue therapy available. We don't have that with any certainty here, but I think it's the only way forward as an alternate to random uh, collecting uh, real world evidence, which is you know non-randomized, just trying to track what happens post-vaccine use to re really comparing uh, vaccines down the road. I've argued that it's ethical to do it as long as the volunteers step forward. So we'll see. So in sum, we're gonna get emergency use. It will go to the highest risk, most in need people to being protected from death not infectivity, we don't have endpoints on that, but nursing home residents, healthcare workers, people who clean rooms, people who might die, that is where it's going. Then it'll spread out to the over 65s and the comorbidly at risk of death. These are vaccines that we're studying to prevent your death, not so much to prevent spread, but that's gonna come at a big price. It's going to, I think, undermine future trials. And as I said, I think we may wind up going to challenge trials. So I'll stop there. Excellent. Those are wonderful presentations and we have lots of questions coming from the audience. We wanna remind everyone that you can enter your questions in the Q&A section and we try to get to as many of them as we can right now. Um, we touched on a number of different topics with the questions. Maybe we'll get started with who approves the members of a DSMB? Are there disqualifying factors? Should disclosure data be different in times of a pandemic? Not sure who would like to tackle that. Well, how about I try to start and then anyone else on the panel who wants to hop in can hop in. Um, so the NIH has some rules about who should be on a data safety monitoring board. Um, an ethicist is optional. Uh, it depends on the, the, the subject of the, the study. Uh, they basically say that there should be people who, as I read in the in the um, slide set, have experience with clinical trials and, and data analysis, definitely one biostatistician, and then people who have expertise in the disease or condition under study. 
um, with regard to who actually picks those experts and impanels them. It's typically whoever is setting up the data safety monitoring board, which is frequently the drug sponsor. So for example, I think Art said Pfizer earlier, and that's why it's stuck in my head. But if Pfizer is running a, a trial for you know, one of its products, then Pfizer would be the one to set up the data safety monitoring board. But the people who serve on the data safety monitoring board serve in an individual capacity and uh, you know, other, other than um, receiving compensation if they choose so to do so. Um, they, they don't have any other ties with Pfizer. So you, you would have uh, exclusions for conflicts of interest and then whatever um, you know, deliberations the data safety monitoring board has would be private and confidential and not shared with the monitor uh, or the FDA except for whatever determination they make for, for public use. Um, and I think oh, the last question was, should, should transparency be held to a different uh, level during a, a pandemic? I don't know if we want to say that across the board for all pandemics. I mean, maybe, maybe not, but at least in this situation where there's been such uh, disinformation and such politicization of things, I think transparency is, is probably um, you know, a, a better route to go than not. And you can certainly be transparent about who is on your panel with still keeping confidentiality about the data that's under review and what the discussions entail. Thank Anyone you. else wanna fill in about that? I don't know if it's filling in, but I, I wanna make sure I understand accurately because the, the couple that I've been on, I think were basically established through the IRB's oversight. So is it the IRB that establishes the need for, uh, for a data safety monitoring board, the composition, the, the sort of rules for when they're going to, how they get started? Is that all the, the IRB that says that? Why, why, why have a data safety monitoring board? That kind of thing. Well, now you're putting me on the spot because I actually don't know. So, I mean, I would, uh, Claudia probably knows this, but I, I would say the FDA <laughs> probably weighs in at a certain point and says, make sure you're going to have a DSMB for this. And then the DSMB and the IRB work synergistically back and forth. So one of the things the DSMB does is it reviews, for instance, the informed consent and can send it back to the IRB and say, this needs modifications. And of course, what the IRB does has implications for what the DSMB does too. So uh, Claudia, do you know this? Claudia, my, Claudia, Claudia used to work in the pharmaceutical industry, which is why I'm thinking she might know this. Yeah, um, in my experience, it's always nominated by the sponsor, but it needs to be done in such ways that will be accepted both by FDA and the IRBs. So if you don't have the caliber of individuals that they would consider to be acceptable, you could get pushed back and they may not accept it, which would be a problem. This committee is hold a lot of power. So it is in the best interest of the sponsor to have the credibility necessary to carry their function. And so, I mean, Matt, as someone who's been on a data safety monitoring board, you know the first thing that they do before they see any data is develop their charter about this is how we're going to handle disagreements, this is how we're going to disclose any conflicts of interest that arise, et cetera. Uh, and and the, the roster of names I know goes to the sponsor and FDA. So I just think it's a big intertwined ecosystem. That's fair. Any other comments on this point from anyone? So I we'll just have on. one, one uh, comment, just so you know. The reason DSMBs historically have been kept private, both the, uh, in terms of the members, is so that investment people don't harangue them to get insider information. That's really what's going on. So, I've had it happen to me on DSMBs. People call up and say, could you give us a little information for $1,000 about uh, how these studies are looking? So uh, that's really one, it's one reason why they've not been transparent about membership. There's definitely an element of protecting that membership and allowing them to have the most open dialogue internally that's not going to be influenced by the sponsor or any other parties but um, it, it, it would be nice to have a mechanism that can balance the two and figure out a way that some information is shared in terms of what the decision making principles were used and what the different attributes of the members were i think there's probably a, 
a midpoint that could be achieved. And Claudia, I'll just say before we move on to another topic that I actually think in in you know orphan diseases or or diseases where there's you know just not a ton of people who specialize in that, it would be very interesting uh, to have transparency into the DSMB members just to see you know are all for example ALS trials using you know basically the same specialist or or you know is there diversity and who's on these trials and right now I don't think we know that. Interesting. Um, there was an, an, a question that I suspect everyone really enjoy, which was the basic question is whether there is any evidence value in anything but well-designed RCTs. And maybe we could kick it off with Holly, given the different presentations of the different studies. I think that that might have been the presentation that prompted the question. Yeah, I mean, look, so I'm a, I'm a lawyer and an ethicist, right? I'm not a statistician, I'm not a clinical trialist, so I have to be careful here. But it, the way the question is worded is so stark. I mean, of course, of course, there's evidentiary value in other types of study. Other, There are other ways of knowing besides RCTs. But with a, with, um, a disease like COVID, where um, people experience the disease so differently, right? Some people have no symptoms, some people get better spontaneously, some people are, you know, the COVID long haulers. Sorry, is my video not on? No, we said Holly, but it showed, it showed uh, Allison. But now we see you. Okay, sorry, I just got a private chat saying to put my video on, but I thought it was already on. Um, anyway, uh, so yes, I mean, there are different, there are different ways of knowing, but when you have a disease that's so variable, right, it becomes hard to know whether people are getting better on their own or they or whether they got better because of the intervention. So just let's take a really um, public and salient example. When Donald Trump comes out and says, I got the Regeneron product and it cured me, um, how does he know that it was the Regeneron product and not, you know, other things that he received while he was at Walter Reed um, or, you know, having access to, um, you know, world class medical care that um, many, many people in our country don't have access to. Right. Or maybe he would have gotten better, you know, on his own, even with no intervention. Right. So it, in those contexts that's where you need stronger trial design to have more certainty um, about the safety and efficacy of the products at hand. Now, I think Art is right that we're gonna have to make some sacrifices with regard to vaccines. Um, and that might be okay, right? Because the types of data that we're seeing at the start are so promising, right? That it becomes difficult to tell people, no, you have to wait or no, you have to hold on until we have absolute certainty about all relevant questions that we might um, be curious about. So there, there are trade-offs. This is a balance. I think probably on this panel, people will have different opinions about how much evidence is enough. Um, but I think we'll probably all agree that RCTs are not the only way of knowing. Excellent. Uh, Art, if we can come back to you on warp speed, there is a question about whether we can compare to other strategies being used worldwide where vaccine research studies are being accelerated. Do you have any sense on, of how warp speed compares to other efforts? Yeah, the Europeans is the one I understand, and they are basically doing what they call rolling assessment of the data. Instead of having a meeting where, if you will, the experts meet and if from FDA or the FDA advisory committee and look at a fixed data point saying, we're two thirds of the way through, here's the statistics, it looks good. They're basically taking data on a rolling basis. And at any moment they could say, we're gonna give early approval. Everything I hear from my European sources said that's coming pretty fast. So I don't think they're gonna to be too far behind what the FDA does in December. So one group is a snapshot in a moment in time. Here's the data. We think two thirds of the way out, it's looking pretty good on safety and efficacy. The other is you submit data on a rolling basis and at any moment, our experts could say that's good enough, we approve. Excellent. Um, we are being asked also who or what is preventing the initiation of challenge trials in the US? Have other countries begun any of these studies? And what do we know so far about the study outcomes? <coughs> Well, Matt was smiling. Does that mean he wants to take that on? 
I was smiling because I think that's Art's question, uh, having having proposed that we should be doing challenge trials. Why are we not doing challenge trials, Art? Well, the answer is they're ethically about as controversial as you can get deliberately infecting people with uh, dangerous agents leads uh, many to say, then you just can't do it no matter what the benefits might be. However, I think it's not just dangerous agents, it's trying to reduce risk would be my argument. So you use younger subjects. Some would say then you can't generalize out to older subjects. Maybe, we'll see, but some information is better than no information, I think. And if you uh, take really volunteers, I think the risk is about the same as letting people donate a kidney or a section of liver in terms of likelihood of death. So we permit that. And I think consistency says permit this. Um, but it's really the core reason is you don't have a way to rescue people if they got very, very sick. You've got a few things that maybe help. You know, we're hearing about them on the call today, but not good enough. Uh, you can't ask people to die in order to uh, be in experiments. Uh, you know, you can't have that kind of risk out there. Uh, I think it's a manageable risk. I think people could volunteer for it, but that's really it. Yeah, there, as the, the person writing the question may already know, there's a very large group of people in the One Day Sooner movement um, who have signed up already to say, I would love to be in a challenge trial um, let me do this. And, and I think, you know, what, what Art laid out with one addition, uh, which is this is a nine month old disease. Well, 10 month old disease. Um, and so even if we think we can pull people through it, and even if we think that the risk to a young person in catching COVID is relatively low, we actually don't know what's going to happen two years down the road, three years down the road, even to young people. Who caught this right and god forbid we uh you know in, intentionally infect a bunch of people with this virus in order to test a vaccine and then um you know the the people who catch it uh end up having some horrible um outcome a year or two later right and that would not be unheard of for a viral illness with cns manifestations right we, there are other examples of uh, vaccine preventable viral illnesses that cause distant uh, side effects that are really quite severe. Absolutely. And I was just going to I was just going to add one additional thing, which you know I think Art's right that the the risk level has gotten most of the attention here, um, and the lack of ability to kind of safeguard against really extreme consequences. And Matt has kind of laid out that the consequences could be extended over time. Uh, to me, the bigger ethical question is whether we need them, right? Whether they have adequate social value to justify that risk and uncertainty. Um, it may be, maybe we will continue to need them to answer these out outstanding questions as Art has articulated, even following on the traditional phase three trials that are giving us these, these early efficacy readouts. I'm not quite there yet. Uh, I'm being convinced that, that we need them. I want to make sure that we touch on probably the, the one question that I think is on everyone's mind, given the, the title of the webinar, which is, what do you think is the most important lesson or lessons regarding scientific evidence that we should take from this experience in this pandemic? Can I go first? Not because I think I know the most on this topic. And of course, I want to hear what my panelists say, but because I had been wanting to say something about a previous topic, and I think it ties together here. So a minute ago, we had someone who was saying, asked Holly, you know, can, can you get evidence, useful evidence from something other than an RCT? And Holly said, you know, of course, I mean, you know, in certain circumstances, you have to be able to use um, something other than an RCT. And, and I would just want to echo that and say, you know, there are times when a randomized control trial is not ethical. There are times when a randomized control trial is not feasible. And so there's been an ongoing effort that I've been involved in, along with some of the other people on this panel, for a couple of years saying, uh, if you look at non-trial pre-approval access, expanded access, otherwise known as compassionate use, can you collect data from that that is useful for either regulatory or, or payer purposes, uh, as opposed to just being noise? And, you know, we now have had the largest expanded access program in US history with convalescent plasma. 
almost 100,000 people got convalescent plasma through this. So, you know, biostatisticians and others need to sit down and say, was the data that was collected from this useful or because it wasn't an RCT, was it, you know, not useful or, or is it somewhere in between? Um, and then on the other end of the spectrum, if you look at the ultra, ultra rares, where, it's, you know, you might have a 30 person trial, but 60 people get access to the investigational product outside of the trial through expanded access. You know, I would argue at very least you should be collecting sa safety data from, from that just because you have such a, a comparatively large number. And what I, what I wanna transition from this to say is, I think that we're looking at two things. We're looking at the robustness of the trial design. And that comes to this question of, is something other than a RCT useful? But the other thing is we're looking at the robustness of the publication of the data. And we've always up until now had this fail, you know, this fail safe of peer review, where if you public, if you tried to publish really crappy data that didn't support the conclusions you were making, some, you know, editor and, and reviewer too, and what have you, we're going to have you go back and, and justify it or rewrite it or, you know, rein in your ambitions for that data. And I think this is the first real pandemic or, or disease situation where I can think of where data has just been handed out pretty freely. I mean, we're not waiting for you know, the New England Journal of Medicine or whatnot to publish things. Things are coming out in preprints. We had things released from investor calls. We had a press conference in the White House. So, I mean, I think when we're thinking about lessons that we need to learn going forward, we need to think about, you know, really the robustness of trial designs and what's possible in a pandemic. But we also, and I'm just bringing this up because we hadn't mentioned it up until now, we need to be thinking about this free flow of information and is it helpful or is it harmful or if it's both, how do we decide when it's good and when it's not? Yeah, I would agree with Allison, although I think something's happening, which is we're not going back to the old days where people don't do anything until there's peer reviewed assessment of data. Holly, Allison and I uh, have talked a lot, not so much with Matt, but amongst ourselves about the fact that there are other groups out there with ALS or whatever they've got who are watching all this speed and saying, hey, what about us? We'd like to get approval faster on limited data or incomplete data or data that looks promising. And we don't want, we don't have time and we don't want to wait. So we think that you need to take a look and reassess what happens with preprint information, what happens with uh, journalism, you know, data reporting by press conference or press release, which we see what happens with people saying, well, you know, the DSMB thinks there's something interesting here and that's good enough. And then we'll just try to follow as best we can what goes on or if I'm right and we do things like, and then we'll do barbaric challenge studies or whatever to follow up, whatever it is, but we're not going backwards. This has clearly been a wrenching experience and others are watching who want speed over, if you will, data uh, finality. I would just add in, in terms of lessons, I, I think we have to do some deep soul searching about um, equipoise and the willingness of clinicians to put their patients in trials, right? So um, we, we saw this in the pandemic um, early on, and it's, it's continuing, um, where, as Matt described, this, this challenge about you know, look, if people are going to die anyway, should we throw the kitchen sink at them, right? For lack of a more delicate phrase. <laughs> um, and, you know, that's not a way to actually figure out what works. So what is it that's standing in the way of clinicians being willing to enroll their patients in, in trials? You know, Matt laid out, there are logistical challenges, there are funding challenges, but at the end of the day, it seems to still be this kind of, um, uh, I was going to call it a professionalism challenge. I don't mean it in the sense of unprofessionalism. I mean it in the sense of what what is the proper understanding of a clinician's professional obligation to the patient in front of them um, versus kind of population health and the ability to know what's going to be safe and effective. Not a new issue, but clearly one that has not been resolved and this pandemic has laid it bare. Matt, anything you'd like to add? Um, yeah, so one quick point, which is that um, 
there are going to be there, one of the questions that popped up, I think, and maybe we're going to go here next is about advocacy and the role of advocacy groups in the research agenda. Um, and I think we're, t we're starting to touch on that here because um, if you look historically, advocacy groups have both been um, a tremendous boon and a stimulus to uh, research and a problem, right? Because uh, it was advocacy groups that really encouraged, even required uh, the federal government and insurers to cover unproven treatments that later turned out not to be helpful and even to be harmful. But once something is in the mainstream like that and it becomes the standard of care and everyone wants it, it becomes impossible uh, essentially to do a quick trial to find out whether it actually works. And so I, I have really mixed feelings about the role of advocacy in research. Um, you know, I think the question was asking about the HIV experience where advocates were tremendously important and influential in building a, a rapid research agenda. And at the same time, some of those advocacy groups were arguing that we should have access immediately and without barrier to investigational products that turned out to not work. In fact, a movie was made about one of these therapeutics and, you know, this becomes a pop culture thing, right? The movie makes it sound like, you know, because of advocacy, they got access to this life-saving therapeutic. It didn't work. It was, it was a therapeutic that failed. And, and in fact, the, the fact that people were able to access it probably slowed down the development of therapeutics that actually did work. So it, it's, a, it's just a, a very complex thing. So that's number one. Number two... There are opportunities that arise with emergency use authorizations to rapidly collect data, not in a randomized controlled trial, but still in a pretty rigorous way. And I'll give you one example, which is I know now of at least two states, uh, including our own, that are setting up uh, random allocation processes for the Lilly monoclonal antibody and probably also the Regeneron one whenever we get that. Um, actually in hand. But we're going this week, um, we're starting to allocate people on a random basis because we don't have enough of it for everyone who might want it. And, you know, this is a little bit of making lemonade out of uh, lemons. W you know, if we had more, we'd give more out, but we don't. We don't know who really benefits from it. And so we are going to randomly assign it, people will uh, will basically apply, they'll get a result, and they will either get the drug or they won't. So it's not a randomized controlled trial, there's no control in terms of a placebo, anything like that. But we will be able very quickly, the, the RCT that approved the Lilly monoclonal had 465 patients in it, total. And so the numbers there are just tiny. Um, we'll have several thousand doses over the next couple of weeks. Those will be randomly allocated. We have about probably 30,000 people a week right now who are eligible to get this drug in Colorado because we're having a big surge as is as much of the country. Um, so we're going to have a bunch of people who are uh, trying to get the drug and can't because we just don't have enough of it. And we'll be able to look at the people who get it and the people who don't get it and see whether there are subgroups that really derive more benefit. So. It's a, it's a fair and ethical way of allocating a limited resource. And it's also a quick way to learn how to be even more and equitable and efficient about that because we will, we will learn, you know, within a few thousand doses, we'll have multiples more patients um, under our belt than were in the initial trial that, that was used for the emergency use authorization. So I think if we can figure out how to use the, the desire that people have to get something that is new and in short supply as a way to um, acquire information quickly, there, that would be a benefit that comes out of this. It's I mean, I'll just note though, right, that the scarcity there is um, unintentional and as a result of the yes. manufacturing difficulties. But FDA exists basically to create scarcity in the trial process, right? I mean, they they um, they are blocking access so that we can get trials done, right? That's a that's a very um, stark way of putting it, but I think 
that's that's partly why in the expanded access context we say even if you could get get access right you can only have this pathway available to you if you're not going to interfere with clinical trials right and so the eua pathway um makes that quite difficult and i think you hit the nail on the head matt when you said it could have the impact of slowing things down that could be better right think about all the patients that wasted their time and all of the clinicians and all the money wasted on hydroxychloroquine we could have been devoting attention to other things i want to just call our attention because we have just one minute to go we just have a couple of questions that we wanted to touch on really quickly um we got a question as to i uh, want oh, any point or under any circumstances should taking the vaccine be mandatory or a prerequisite to work, for example, at a healthcare facility or to go to school? Well, I can tell yeah, you right so off the bat, it's gonna be mandatory for the military. I mean, military frequently mandates all sorts of things. It's very, and I'll uh, jump in on that. I agree with Allison, the military will take some of the supply and it will be mandatory and the decision will be which arm and that's it. They're they're. They're not going to hesitate. They'll move forward, presuming, you know, if there's safety issues, they'll get picked up at the VA, not by the military, which is a separate problem that uh, the VA fills in for whatever goes wrong in active military. But all that said, it's very tough to mandate an emergency use uh, a vaccine under that circumstance. But I will say this. I believe we're gonna see extraordinary pressure bought by some private health systems to get vaccinated. The state ones with uh, nurses and unions may balk and fight, but at NYU where Allison and I are at, I think you're gonna see heated pressure to say, you wanna work, get back to work, you better take this. I don't think they'll mandate it, but boy, they're gonna, they will push hard just knowing the culture. And I have rebutted Art on this numerous times saying, that's great unless you have someone who has a chronic illness or is pregnant or otherwise was not in the trial and then you cannot ethically force them to get something that there's not trial data on how it works on you. Yeah. Put in some more websites because unfortunately webinars because unfortunately we are out of time but I want to thank all the participants today and as well as our attendees for the great questions. And I also want to thank uh, Colorado University uh, Center for Bioethics. David Weil and Mila Imber for hosting us today. Thank you so much, everyone. And we'll talk again soon, I hope. Thank you.